uh, authentic empathy is essential in my view to to say hey i'm here i'm listening i totally get i totally get it and i'm with you i understand this is difficult what do we need to what do we need to do together to make a good use of this time Welcome to the coaching studio. I'm Lissa DeHart, your host. And in this episode, I am thrilled to have Lucia Baldelli. She is a MCC with the International Coaching Federation and the co-author of The Human Behind the Coach. Lucia, Lucia is a distinguished figure in the coaching world, ranking third globally in the agile space with over two decades of experience in organizational coaching. She has honed her skills in multicultural environments, becoming fluent in three languages. Lucia is a visionary founder of the Coaching Outside the Box Coaching School, dedicated to unleashing human potential through innovative coaching techniques. Join us as we explore Lucia's journey, her insights into the human behind the coach, and her passion for empowering individuals and organizations through coaching. Lucia, welcome to the show. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me, Lisa. It's a great pleasure to be here with you today. Oh, I'm so excited about it. I really am. I've been looking forward to this. As you know, we've had a couple of uh, opportunities and then things in life got in the way. And and so I'm very excited that we are here today together at the same time and in the same space. So, you know, it's sort of interesting as I was reading your bio and this idea of being really being very well trained in agile theory and agile, I guess, scrum and those sorts of techniques. I'm really curious at this move because I, maybe I don't understand it very well, but I've always felt like that's a much more sort of like, let me help you solve a problem. And you became an MCC coach, which is very much a different person that you're being. And I'm really curious about the journey that you've taken in your career that has led you to this place. Absolutely. So first of all, maybe let me share uh, for the people who don't know about it, what Agile is. Uh, Agile is a group of methodology, uh, iterative and incremental methodologies for software development. And Agile coaches are uh, people supporting teams uh, deliver software in this way. And so they have uh, basically different hats they need to wear at different times. And yes, there are uh, some moments where we need to train people because we have their expertise. Mm -hmm. But more mature teams or leaders or, you know, uh, even senior executive that hire us, we don't use that stance, of course, but we are coaches. And so professional coaching is a fundamental skill that agile coaches need to grow. And that's how I, you know, I, I get to know about professional coaching. So I was working on my personal development and I started a professional coaching course because I wanted to become a better team coach and here I am. <laughs> yeah. So, so what, uh, were you in software development um, before you became an agile coach? That's where I began. Yeah. 20 plus years ago. Uh, but I, I do very little in the agile space at the moment for the last maybe six, six ten years. And so my work is more is now predominantly with leadership team executives and organiza entire organizations who help in transform and change. Yeah. So it's, it's changed over time. But yeah. yes, that's, that's what I come from. Yeah. And that's what I think is really fascinating. What really was that moment that led you to shift from this one perspective towards this newer, this new, more very coach specific spectrum that you found yourself? Well, when I started to uh, become the, my personal development journey towards becoming a professional coach, and as I grew throughout the journey, I realized I was able to have a deeper impact on the people I work with. And so I became more passionate about doing that rather than being the expert in the room, if you know what I mean. And as my role evolved, I started to work with uh, more senior leaders and they don't need any agile, to be honest, uh, because that's more for software development teams. And so 
that's where I, you know, sort of abandon or put on the side is still still a skill, still something in my backpack. But I my my work nowadays is predominantly outside of agile. Yeah. And so how did that exploration of yourself develop you? What did you what did you learn about yourself on this ex- extraordinary journey you've been on? Well, um, first you learn you have to do a lot of work on yourself before you're able to help others. And I'm sure we're going to talk about that because it's <laughs> part of the book. Um, and uh, and that it, so I started with a destination in mind. So I wanted to become a certified coach to build my credibility and, you know, make a greater impact potentially. But then I realized that the journey itself is so much more rewarding than achieving the destination because after you achieve that there's probably another destination after that yeah it really does keep going i always think of it it's like a it's like a road sign it's not an ending it's just the next mile marker along the path towards something way down the road you said something earlier as you were talking about the the depth of work you were able to shift into as you moved into coaching and i'm curious what you noticed as you were exploring more depths with your clients? So it's about the depth of the connection, the, the capability to build trust, um, the, um, the the depth of the exploration. I mean, you're not talking to someone uh, with, with a challenge, to a problem, but you are connecting to the human that is behind that challenge. And so you're able to have a deeper impact on the people you coach if you're working one-on-one. I do a lot of work with teams as well. And so it's all about, uh, you know, building that trust and growing that group emotional intelligence that can help those people have tough conversations about, you know, topic that, topics that are hard to discuss, for example, and get to a new level of, um, of team maturity, of, you know, creativity, performance, collaboration. And so... Uh, it, it's all a journey. It, and as you grow yourself, the impact you can make grows. And mm-hmm. as we were saying before, you know, it it doesn't end. And, and you become passionate about something else you learn. And so you, be, you know, I'm, sh- I'm sure it resonates with you and with a lot of people that will listen to it. Yeah. Well, and I think that it, I think it's such a fascinating thing how our passions are the things that drive us forward as we do more, whether it is that self exploration that we're doing inside of ourselves, which I think is fundamental to really being passionate about something because then we become more and more curious, right? And, and through that, then it continues to magnify and develop and magnify and develop. And, and along the way, it sounds like it really led you to this idea of, of exploring this idea of human, the human behind the coach. I would love to hear more about really how you even got to that exploration, as well as some of what you've learned through the exploration. So we started a conversation around mastery, actually. Um, and the initial book we were going to write was going to be called Growing into Mastery and was going to be f- focus on you know what we need to grow the skills we need to grow to become masterful coaches but then we bin that book <laughs> uh, and it was a fun experience because as we were talking about um uh you know competencies and markers and all of that we realized that um focusing on that and focusing on tools and techniques which are the the fundamental skills we build particularly at the beginning of our journey, can take us to a point and then what happens? And so it felt like they are useful to reach you a level of grounded confidence mm-hmm. where we can actually forget about them <laughs> because we know we're going to be able to handle difficult situation and we feel we're okay with that, with whatever happens in the session. And then we can really focus on who we are being in the coaching room. And so what we started to do was to explore um, the qualities we need to grow. So how do we need to show up differently in the coaching room to be able to make a different impact and demonstrate what we call art instead of mastery? Uh, As you know, I'm I'm referring to not skills or uh, markers, but 
humanity, yeah, the, the a deeper connection and a deeper impact in those we coach. And so the idea became, what are the qualities we need to demonstrate in the coaching room uh, that can have a significant impact on, on our coaching and on, on the person in front of us? And so we came up with a list. Of course, it's not exhaustive. I'm sure um, there's more to that. But those are the ones that we believe were fundamental um, uh, to, to spark transformation in those in front of us. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because you, as you were talking and you said, you know, there's these fundamentals, the markers, the things that we need to learn in order to be able to get to a place of, then we can set them to the side because they're already, we embody them. We understand the importance of agreement setting. So we don't have to think about it anymore. We understand how to evoke awareness and listen deeply. So we don't have to think about it anymore. And then we also know how to facilitate client growth. So we don't have to think about it anymore. And then it's that move. I love this idea of this move from mastery as the way that we are able to hold the, the container of a coaching conversation towards artistry and how we really, I think I, I wrote a, I wrote a blurb for your book. And I think I talk about the dance, right? The kind of the artistic and creative process that is involved in being with other people in that fluid creative space of relationship, if I'm hearing you correctly. Absolutely. Yes. Because we don't know how it's going to go, right? We have to be okay with whatever happens in the session. With We have no control about how the conversation will go. And so we have to be okay with that. And the moment we 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 forget about that and we forget about, you know, the tools we need to use and being ready to face any situation. The markers we need to the hit. Markers, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> then we, I think we can also... Um, take a little bit of pressure off our shoulders because it's not really our job to get to an outcome. So we start sharing responsibility for achieving that uh, with the person in front of us. And then it becomes more of a dance, as you say, because when we don't know, it's okay to be vulnerable and say, where are we going next? You know, I don't really know. Maybe not, I'm not going to say that, but we don't know. And so yeah. vulnerability is another one uh, that we explore because there's a lot of vulnerability in saying, where should we take this conversation? Like, I feel stuck. Yeah. Like, yeah. And, and I think there's, I was just talking with a group of coaches yesterday and it, and I didn't talk about it in the framework of this letting go, but what's showing up for me as you're talking is this idea of how do we let go so that we can just be with the person. And one of the things that I see, and I'd be really curious to hear your thoughts on this, is this, this attachment to the outcome, this attachment to me as the coach being responsible for your outcome, um, how, how it ends up pulling people into this place of performance and and they're out of presence with their clients they're out of presence even with themselves they don't even notice those internal indicators and i'm curious what you've noticed i've noticed that there's also status there's how much we charge so there's so many things that might increase the pressure on us right imagine we're coaching an executive or someone we believe very successful how much more pressures are we likely to put on ourselves because we are we have to provide value? Okay, right, because we're charging a lot. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, we're charging a lot. And so, uh, you know, I'm going to tell you a funny story. My mother is an accountant and she's been a consultant for her own her, her entire professional life. And once she told me, you really need to tell me what you do because I don't understand that. And I explained it to her and she said, are you being paid without providing any answers? <laughs> <laughs> yes, mom. Why, yes, I am. Um, that <laughs> yes. is hilarious. That is so funny. May I share a similar story with you? Sure. I, I was a big sister. I don't know if you have big sisters and little and big brothers and, and 
Italy, but in the U S we have a program where they, they match an adult with a child and you, you know, you have a relationship with this, this amazing kid. And I was a big sister for about seven years. And my little sister said to me one day, what do you do? And I said, I talk to people and she goes, <laughs> no, I mean, like, what do you really do? <laughs> the same sort yeah, of thing. Like, less. what? Yeah. You talk to people? Yeah, that's what I do. <laughs> so yeah, I think I think we put a lot of pressure on ourselves. And I see that in, you know, beginner coaches and people who are going for certification for ACC in particular, it's like, I'm stuck. What am I going to do next? And then panic kick, kicks in and and we take responsibility. Yeah, and then gone. The session is gone, right? Then we maybe start leading or, um, I don't know, we have a plan in mind. Yeah. You know, sometimes I've heard people compare the, the coach to an orchestra conductor because the, we don't play an instrument, right? We're there for someone else to succeed. Exactly. The big difference, in my view, is that we don't know the lyrics. <laughs> right, we're not an expert on the tempo, the beat, or the music. <laughs> There's no music sheet, right? We, we don't have a place to read where we're going to go next. We get we have to figure it out. Yeah. And so that makes it incredibly uncomfortable for some people uh, because we have to let go of controlling. We can't control. And control is one of the quality. You know, letting go of control is one of the qualities we explore. Yeah. And, and I don't know, I'm curious as you have, have gone through this process of learning to let go, because I mean, at one point you're an expert, right? And I think this is something that pretty much every culture trains people to do. Like you need to be, grow up and become an expert at something, right? So that you can teach other people stuff, whatever the stuff is to your mom's point, you know, you need to be able to share your wisdom with people and help them to be successful. And that letting go of that is a is a form of whether it's a developmental stage or an evolution in our way of being. How did you navigate that movement from expert to being able to sit in the space of not knowing and letting go? So one interesting thing about uh, the writing process was to find out that actually there were some life events that um, got me to develop some of these qualities. For example, um, one about control is about um, was about moving. At some point, I moved my family, and this is a story of uh, you know letting go of control and also a huge amount of vulnerability uh, because we sold the house. I had a uh, basic school English, uh, you know, school level, high school yeah. level. And uh, my husband, even more basic. <laughs> 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 yes, if I think about it, like, Lucia, really? Uh, and two young kids, we sold the house and we moved to um, a UK colony in the south of Spain. Uh, it's a tiny British territory in the south of Spain, beautiful place. It's called Gibraltar. And when we moved there, I experienced the highest vulnerability I felt in my life uh, because, you know, I could have been made redundant. I, I remember I went to the first meeting with a team in India and the guys in India were speaking really fast. They were very fluent. And at the end of the meeting, my manager asked me if I had any questions. And I said, <laughs> Yes, what was the topic they discussed? <laughs> <laughs> and so it, that was an incredibly, you know, vulnerable time of my mm. life. And, you know, we had nowhere else to roll back or we had sold the house in Italy. But it was the beginning of a new life experience that, you know, got me and, and my kids to learn new languages, experience, you know, multi live, live in contact with multiple culture. Uh, you know, grow in the in the profession because, of course, we were exposed to new reality, new context. But then, we we feel like we don't belong anywhere anymore. And even now that we've moved back to Italy, we don't um, we don't know if this is going to be where we're going to spend the rest of our lives. And so, we can't control that. Maybe we're going to move in two years uh, when my oldest goes to uni. Um, maybe not. We don't know. And so 
I I was someone who was really, really stable and I'm someone who likes to plan a lot. And so this was really hard for me because yeah. I really had to let go of stability, of knowing, yes, this is where I'm going to settle because I don't know. But I value that more. Uh, I value that freedom more than stability or anything else. And so if yeah. you take that into the coaching room, this becomes, you know, a, a place where I had to train that muscle that I can then demonstrate with the people I coach. You know, a couple of things are coming up as you're talking. The first thing is I think that most, okay, this is a generalization. So take it for a generalization, but I think that most people who learn this process of letting go do not learn it externally, they learn it internally through something that happens to them, whether it is in your case, this major move with school level English, moving to an English colony at the South of Spain and being like, you know, uh, what was the topic, right? Like, I mean, that's a major, and you've also not just you, this isn't like you're like 25 and you're going and doing this on your own. You're also bringing your family and your husband and leaving your country and selling your house. Like there isn't a whole bunch behind you to support you in case of anything. So you have to make it work. Um, and, and I think that is a common theme where people look at a situation that they find themselves in, sometimes chosen, sometimes not chosen, and how they're going to, how they're going to embrace the experience makes all the difference in what they learn from it. I don't know what, what's showing up for you as I say that. So when I think about, uh, how this shifted in the coaching room, there were a couple of occasions uh, at the beginning. Well, when I was practicing, I don't remember if I was practicing towards ACC or PCC, where I I asked the question about, uh, you know, um, what do we need to explore about this topic that will get you closer to your goal? And I had my recipe for success in mind. <laughs> So already I'm cooking away in the kitchen. Yeah, I know what <laughs> we're going to discuss. I know exactly. But the response I got back was like completely different. And so in, in that occasion, I realized that I was making assumptions. And the moment I make assumptions, I'm choosing for my client. Mm -hmm. And probably I'm taking a direction that is not the most useful for the conversation right instead if i lower the noise of my opinions i can be fully open to like why why is this a unique challenge for you and what makes it a challenge for you which is different from what will make it for me right right and so it's about bringing that curiosity and and being aware that we interpret what we hear with our own filters based on what we will feel or think or experience in a similar situation, mm -hmm. but probably on, on the receiving end, something very different is happening, right? Mm -hmm. And so about knowing that and, you know, lowering the noise of what we feel, what we think, what we will experience in that scenario. Yeah, you use the word assumptions, right? I think it's the, I think for myself, it's always testing hypotheses. I could be right. Like I could make a really good guess about what you need, but boy, how much more is offered if instead of assuming I'm right, I ask you, and then you can course correct me. Yes. Oh my gosh. Yes, that's right. No, that's absolutely not it at all. Or something in the middle, right? But at least then the, the, the invitation is handed back to the client to make that determination for themselves. And the assumption was turned from an assumption into an inquiry. Yes. Yeah or into an intuition right i'm sensing yeah. this or, it could be wrong could be right in my belly i feel it in my belly what's yeah. happening for you right and so we enable discovery self-discovery in that case 
Yeah. I, and I think it's such a major thing for coaches because I, I mean, the question I hear a lot that I talk with coaches about often, and you probably do too, which is how do you, how do you really demonstrate this sharing of an intuition, sharing of an insight, and also turning it back to the client? What are your thoughts when you hear those kinds of questions from coaches? I like to, um, but this is my individual style and approach. Of course like it is. <laughs> <laughs> I like to check in with myself, with what I'm sensing um, and what I'm seeing. So observable data would be something I would try to, you know, play back, mirror back as much as possible, like, Oh, you're moving your hands so much while you talk. Oh, yes, I'm Italian. <laughs> of course I do. Uh, you're moving your hands quite a lot. What's going on? Like, it's been five minutes since you, you know, shifted. You started talking. And you're... Exactly. Or it's about me. Maybe something that is really happening for me. And I I don't know if it can, if it can be useful, but my body is telling me that it needs attention. And so I would offer that or... So the observable data I'm receiving in trying to make it like sort of neutral data more than, right. oh, there's frustration in your voice. That's an, you know, I that's don't, I don't know about it. I hate it when people tell me how I'm feeling. Um. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. so trying to make it as objective as possible or sharing my experience. You know, this is what ICF calls the use of using self as an instrument, right? Oh, I feel it in my belly, you know, as you share this story. Oh, my God, I feel it here. What's happening for you? Exactly. Right. Yeah. That 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 acknowledgement of what your experience, I love that it, coach as instrument, right? We're an instrument. We can hear the tone. We can feel the vibration in our body. And then we don't assume it's right for everybody. We ask the question. And I mean, how many times have you been in a coaching conversation and the client is telling you something really painful and your heart just like, or your throat just tightens up and it's like, what useful data point might that be for a client to hear? Wow. I'm really feeling a tightening in my chest and my throat as you're talking. How is it? How, what's showing up for you as you share the story? Because it's such a different lens and perspective for them to hear a narrative. They may have said a billion times and have lost sensitivity to. I think that's so important, Lucia, to remind uh, ourselves of. Yeah. And how does this impact who we're being as the human behind the coach? Well, I guess it's um, it's about opening up a space for discovery. Like coming with curiosity, coming with, oh, what what is this person feeling right now? You know, there's a there's a I know you like metaphors. There's a metaphor I like to to use. Um, when I start exploring with a client, um, I like to think about uh, sitting at a table, not just the two of us, but also uh, their emotions the emotions that are present in the conversation right now. And so being aware that there's something going on here that I can't see, but they they know, they feel it, and helping them discover, you know, what's happening, why they're there, where are they coming from, and how what's useful, what is not useful, and what, how do we need to shift for them to be in a more productive place? Yeah, yeah. It's almost like uh, parts work where we're inviting them to notice their wise self, not just their rambunctious teenager or their scared self or whoever, but yeah, like who else at the table. I remember I was reading when I, when I wrote my first book, I was, I had just finished reading Liz Gilbert's book, Big Magic. And it's a book I just really, I really liked it a lot. And in it, she talks about, you know, like your fear and how fear gets in the way of finishing things. And you wrote a book. And so you know that there are moments where you're staring at the page and you're just like, 
I got nothing. Um, and, and, you know, how do we invite the fear to go into the back of the car instead of drive the car? Right. And I, and so I love these sort of ways in which we can explore the different components that a human might be experiencing through their really in their relationship with whatever the situation is that they're having. Yeah. But there's so much trust and so much vulnerability that is required to connect to that level that we can't really get there if we're not connecting to a human. And that's why we need to be human in the first place. Say more (laughs) about that. Yeah. Say more about that, that how we connect to other humans with our own humanity. I'd love to hear more about that. Um. I think it starts from the moment we listen to a story, to the story, right? Um, and I've heard conversation where the, you know, the the response to the story was, and what's the goal we need to accomplish together today? Yeah, could you summarize that into a bullet point? <laughs> <laughs> yes. And so, yeah, I'm, 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 you know, I'm, I'm just playing a joke, but the essence is. Uh, authentic empathy is essential in my view to to say hey i'm here i'm listening i totally get i totally get it and i'm with you i understand this is difficult what do we need to what do we need to do together to make a good use of this time And so this might be really, really hard if we haven't gone through that situation before. Or maybe once I had I had a client where, you know, my my value system was clashing a little bit with hers. And so I I had no I had I will I had I will never go through a similar experience because it it I'm different, right? And so I think it's important to to just be there and acknowledge how they're feeling in regards to that, even though we haven't gone through a similar situation before. Yeah. You know, it's really interesting because I think, I think there are some, excuse me, let me try my words again. I think there are situations in which I may have never been in that situation, situation X, but I've had enough human experiences that I can appreciate fear or vulnerability or, or loss or grief or, or being worried about the next step. Like I I've experienced enough of those kinds of things, but you just brought up something really interesting, which is where we have a client who we have a value clash with and, and how, how do we set our own values to the side so that we can be useful in the conversation with the person in front of us? Well, my first question will will be, can we? Like, can, can we? we? I mean, yeah. that's a really important question because I don't. I think some people maybe can, and maybe some people cannot. I don't know, or maybe nobody yeah. can. And that's the you know. And if you cannot, and you realize you cannot, and that's okay. That's probably you're not probably the right coach for that person. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you can, like a story comes to mind. A lady I coached some time ago who wanted to go freelance. And she was, she came to a coaching session asking, uh, she wanted to be coached about making the decision, you know, shall I go or shall I stay in my employment job? And I gone through a similar situation myself. And it mm-hmm. was really, really hard to, for me to make <laughs> that choice. Right. Now, in, this case, in this case, I had, you know, I had a voice screaming inside me, you know, go for it do it <laughs> so a positive bias <laughs> positive bias exactly but then as she explored her story her situation she wanted a baby and so her in her value system having a baby and starting a new family was at the top mm-hmm. you know instead of start, uh, starting or spending uh, uh, your time your effort on a business on starting a it's business it's like having twins actually quadruplets probably if you try and do both at the same time <laughs> <laughs> and so yeah it's about acknowledging that you know even though you have gone through a similar situation before your list of values when you went through that situation 
were different from the values of the person in front of you. And that is completely fine because it's their choice. It's their life. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, as I'm talking through this story, I, I feel how much curiosity we need to bring and, you know, humility, I would say. So switching off your, our ego, um, switching off what we would want in a similar situation because it's their story, it's their life. Yeah, and that goes back, I guess, in a way, sort of full circle to the idea of we have to let go. And, and I love that you bring up that we, it's not that we're biased always negatively, like, no, that's wrong. No, you shouldn't do that. No, it should be done this way. Sometimes our biases are so positive, like, you got this. Like, yes, do that. This will be wonderful. And to your point, you know, like if I'm making a decision and deciding between a value that's really important to me, in this case, having a baby, starting a family, and starting a a entrepreneurial, <laughs> you know, adventure. That those things may the timing may be wrong for one or the other. If I'm going to give full effort to either, um, and I think that's really important that we're there to not put our value of whether a person should, shouldn't, whatever or can or can't, it just doesn't even matter, but whether or not it really aligns with what's important to them. Because you can always start a business later. I mean, it's not like it's gone forever if you don't do it now. But but I mean, if you do it and you're giving up a dream, how does that impact the business that you create? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, fascinating, fascinating. Hmm. You know, everybody has sort of a, well, everybody, coaches often have sort of a signature about what it is that, how they show up with people. And I think it's developed over time, sort of just like signatures are, um, where we learn to write our name in ways and we're like, oh, that one, I really like this one. And then we start playing with our signature or whatever. I, maybe I'm only speaking to an audience of one here because I spent a lot of time playing with how to write my name. Um, but when you think about your own way of being as a coach, what would you what would you offer other coaches as a way to maybe explore their own being as a coach? Just be curious and don't be the same with everyone. I don't think I I would say I have the same signature in every set. I don't. Absolutely not. Because every client is unique. And every situation of each client is unique. Yeah. So I I even like to negotiate that. And this is something I learned from supervision. So it's not just about the contract, but it's also about the psychological contract. Mm -hmm. what, 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 what kind of coach do you need today? Right? Who do you want me to be today? Yeah. So your signature is fluid. Very, yeah, I yeah, I like it. I like to think it this way. Yeah. Yeah. Being I I think a bit uh, for myself, I mean, I think it's one of the things I, I resonate with you a lot around is I, th I always have thought of myself as a bit as a chameleon in the sense that I could change colors and adapt to what environment I found myself in. And I, and I hear that, like, as you're talking, who does the client need me to be today? I'm, you know, I mean, it's not a hundred percent that I'm great at it because there are days where I could have been better, but I think also there is there is a, a, that willingness to be, you know, guided by the other person towards what it is they need. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And as you think of, again, you know, this idea of the human behind the coach and the idea of the artistry of it and the, and using curiosity, are there any other qualities that a coach might want to expand or explore? Um, silence. Silence yeah. is the first chapter. Silence. I know. Yeah. So hard. <laughs> <laughs> and silence uh, in two, as two, both two meanings. Uh, the first being silence in our head. And we've talked about it somehow. 
And the other is silence in the space between us. So being comfortable with living space, you know, letting people sit with emotion, don't rush. And and this is so cultural. I mean, there's uh, depending on where you are from, you might have, you might feel very uncomfortable with silence and you need to fill it in. And so this is something I, I think um, every coach needs to be able to to create, right? To, to have that space for reflection and to slow down. Imagine a client arrives in a rush from another meeting, unfinished business with a lot of, you know, emotion. Hands <sighs> moving. And, and we need that. We need that silence in our head. We need that silence in their head. Otherwise, the whole session is going to be an emotional outburst and we won't be able to do any deep work. Mm-hmm. Because there's so much going on from whatever we have left five minutes before. Yeah. So in a way, if I'm hearing you correctly, the silence in our head as coach, as we come into the space with the capacity to hold silence, we can also really impact and influence the energy of the experience happening between us. Yes. And a big learning I had during the coaching session, I remember I was practicing for PCC. I had a client uh, who was very silent, like she took a long time to reply. And so my perception of the session was that it was super slow. I was thinking, <laughs> oh, my, oh, mamma mia, this, um, the person who's going to review this is going to get so bored. It was very slow and I was leaving space and I was okay, but I was thinking, oh my God, how long is she taking? And when we finished the session, I asked her, how are you feeling? Like, and she said, Oh, Lucia, you just asked one question after another. It was so hard. And so, even the perceptions, perceptions. Exactly, <laughs> even the perception we have about silence, it's silent for us because we're not doing anything, we're waiting, but it is not for them because they're thinking, they're doing mm-hmm. some hard work. And yeah. so, yeah, even that it's, you know, something not to forget. <laughs> was that a, was that a recording that you submitted for your PCC? I don't remember, but I use it for, with my mentor for sure. <laughs> well, and the reason I'm asking, because I think it would have been really interesting to hear the feedback, because my guess is that it would have been really positive about the capacity to hold silence. Yeah. Yeah, 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 absolutely. You know, to hold space. Yeah, that's brilliant. Um, so, you know, as, as we're sort of winding down, um, are there any people, thought leaders, resources, books that really influenced you as you were working towards your MCC or just in it, working towards yourself as coach that were impactful to you that you would share with us? Well, yes. So the, there's a couple of books that actually um, inspire some of the stories and the learning that went into the book. Uh, one of them was Improv Your Life. Uh, it's written by an improv actress, Pippa Evans, and it taught me so much about coaching. And another one uh, is called Detox Your Ego, and it talks about sportsmen and how they were able to reach a different level of performance when they stop winning for themselves. So it's about humility. It's about switching off your ego to achieve a deeper purpose. And so there were a lot of reflections there and learning about uh, who we are winning for when we are in the coaching room. So if, you know, top sportsmen um, reach a different level of performance when they win for their nation, for their team, for maybe for a charity, Eight. When we are in the coaching room, who are we winning for? And so uh, it yeah. was very curious to discover a lot of stuff about coaching with books that have nothing to do with coaching. Well, and I think it's really important too, because you can really extrapolate that idea towards like, what is your why? I want to make a lot of money. Yes. What is your real why? I really want to impact the world in a way that's meaningful, right? Like if that's your why, you have it goes farther. If it's just about the money, it's like, it's a, I mean, 
you can only get so much money that it even matters to you, number one. And number two, it goes away very quickly at times also. So what are you left with, right? Like what is the important thing? And so it would make sense that athletes who are winning, not just for themselves, me, 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 but rather for their team or their country or for a charity that they would have a very different relationship to the game that they're playing. Mm -hmm. And and the very interesting thing about humility, another story from the book, is that you can't be too humble in the coaching room. Speak a bit more about that. Yeah. Not enough humility means you're going to take too much space, right? So you're going to show off or, um, yeah, it's not about you, right? Um, Too much humility means you're too small and you don't have the, the capability to hold the space. You're not grounded. And so if that happens, your clients are, you know, it becomes about you again because you're being noticed for another reason, right? Right. You're either too big or too oh, small. Yeah, correct. Yes. <laughs> so very interesting reflections from Detox Your Ego. <laughs> yes. And the healthy ego is we are here to learn together. Yes. We're going to figure it out, right? We, we don't know how this is going to go. And I don't have the answer for you, but we'll figure it out. Yeah. And it's going to be fine. But whatever happens is going to be okay. Like, yeah. So as you're thinking about this, like being able to play with the people that you're working with, right? And you're having fun with them and it, everything's going to be okay. It really kind of goes back into the book on improv. And I'm curious as you think about improv and that book, like how it influenced your coaching. Well, you have to be okay with whatever happens. And so practicing improv could be a way to build that muscle in your coaching, to be honest, because you can't predict how the coaching session is going to go. And you have to be ready to face any situation, emotional outburst, um, you know, client completely stuck or very generative the other way around or not willing to go into action. And, you know, any situation could be, could happen and we have to be okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and be willing to play. And and I think also not taking it so seriously. Again, going back to earlier comments, you're not responsible for what the client's outcome is. You're responsible for holding the space and playing in the space with them with curiosity. Oh, Lucia, it was so wonderful to have you on the show today. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It was lovely to chat with you. Thanks for having me. And bye, everyone. Well, and also I just want to say I have my own copy of the book and so I throw it out there. And so if you're interested in learning more about becoming the your own human behind your own coach, uh, it's a wonderful resource. I highly recommend it. So, and again, thank you so much. Good luck, much with, your, with, luck with your book. Oh yeah, tomorrow. Um, but we'll be uh, doing... We'll be hearing this after it's already been published. So yeah, thank you for that. I'm so excited. <laughs> Of course. (laughs) Thank you, Lisa. You're so welcome.